Well, I'm super excited for you to be back. We got to get you in person here again soon and get the lightsabers out. But um, I'm so excited you're here. I'm so excited everybody's here. I'm gonna go off video so I focus on the road. But yeah, let's get the let's get the seats filled in. And John, I'm super excited. It's not okay. logical. It's biological. There you go. <laughs> All right, John, the floor is yours. All right. Well, so listen, I'll start with just saying that I was always the guy with the soft skills. And I worked with a lot of people who had the hard skills. And I was always jealous of them because they seemed smarter. They seemed better. They got paid more. Um, you know, so I'd go around with a chip on my shoulder trying to prove I was valuable while I secretly felt I wasn't as valuable and it was just awkward. And I was always the chief evangelist for the various companies I worked for. I was always in the dot-com arena. And I was a founder, co-founder, or early stage employee. And I raised several hundred million dollars with my various teams. Of course, I didn't do that all myself, but uh, with my various teams in Silicon Valley and beyond, but they still called what I did fluffy. And uh, so, you know, I would go around trying to prove I was valuable and didn't really think I was that valuable. And it, as I said, it was awkward. And then in 2009, I went to the TED conference for the first time and just saw person after person get up on stage and give the most amazing talks I'd ever heard. And I had two big realizations. One is that's really powerful. That is really powerful, that kind of communication. And the second thing I realized is I have not been doing that. You know, even though I was a basically a public speaker, I was the evangelist and talking at conferences and I was usually one of the best speakers at the conference. What I didn't realize is how low the bar was. And so I came back, got really involved in the TED and TEDx community. And at one of the first ever TEDx events, we had this guy who had all the hard skills in the world, the most interesting topic of the day. He was the one I was waiting for the whole time. And when he got up on stage and started to speak, everybody in the room checked out because he was so nervous and awkward, we all thought we were gonna throw up. And it was just sad. And I remember feeling really, really sad for a minute because I'd seen that so much with all the brilliant people that I worked with in my career. And it was, it just made me really sad. And then the evil part of me popped out and I was like, ah, ha, 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 hard skills guys blowing it calls what I do fluffy, neener, 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 you know? And uh, as I was indulging that evil part of myself, my, uh, my buddy came over and he said something that totally changed my life. He said, dude, we got to do something to help people like this. And it was like the clouds parted, the angels sang. And I just realized that if I just got rid of the chip on my shoulder and honored the people right in front of me, I could totally make a difference for that guy. So I went home that night and started working on the training that I now deliver all over the world. I think you've probably heard already. I got to train the NASA astronauts. I pinch myself. I work with Johnson and Johnson and Motorola and Coca-Cola and Boston Scientific. And, you know, I pinch myself when I say that because I didn't really see that coming. But here's what I did differently because of that moment that made all the difference. I realized that if I wanted to make a difference with that guy in particular, but more generally with just people, I would need to base everything I did in human evolutionary biology and human neurophysiology so I could show people not only what works when it comes to communicating with human beings, but also why it works based in science. And that, number one, it works because it's based in science. I didn't think about that. And what it allows me to do is share with people not only what works, but also why it works based in science. And that makes it much easier to be effective when people understand why something works and not just what to do, but also why. So, um, you know, are you, do you, does anybody know what Richard Branson and, uh, oh, uh, Warren Buffett and a bunch of other people, do you know what they say the number one skill you can have in business is? Anybody know? No, the number one skill you can have in business, go ahead. Networking. Networking, Networking is really important. Net, and it's actually relationship building. Um, subtle difference there, maybe. Um, but you're right. That's important. No, the number one thing they say, communication. Investing in yourself and being a better communicator, because that affects everything. 
from networking to, you know, marketing to conversations to management to leadership, it's all communication. So, uh, and you guys are, um, you know, entrepreneurs. So let me just show you something really fast. It's just a picture because I can't get, because this whole thing, it's going to be a little bit um, fuzzy is what I'm trying to say. But can you see that picture of that guy? Um, and that, that check, can you tell how much the check is for? A million dollars, yeah. So let me read this to you. Um, John, I hope you and your family are doing well. Johnson & Johnson sponsored you to help me and others present in their Next Gen Baby Box Quicksfire Challenge program in 2017. I also attended one of your sessions this summer in Boston. Today, I'm happy to share some pretty big news. On August 26th, the state of Ohio awarded us $1 million, no strings attached, to help accelerate our time to market. I presented for 20 minutes and then a 40 minute Q&A with five judges with a million dollars on the line. And it was potentially the most difficult speaking engagement you could imagine. Because of my preparation and previous coaching, I was calm, confident, and felt connected to the judges. Then on September 3rd, we won $200,000 from Massachusetts. We're now well on our way to helping thousands of babies exposed to opioids and their mothers. Thanks. Please keep up the good work helping so many others become competent speakers. Sincerely, John. And that's a picture of him and his wife because she's been such a fabulous support to him. And there's that million dollar check. Now, I show you that and I tell you that because <clears throat> some of the things I'm going to share with you today might sound like they're not as important as they actually are. And that, you know, the reason that John won that million dollars is not because he gave a good presentation. Everybody at that contest gave a good presentation. He gave the presentation that connected the most and that had the biggest impact and that touched the judges the most. And that's why he won. Because to get into that contest, you had to have a good pitch, right? To win the contest, that's the thing we're going to talk about tonight. So the key to that is the thing I always say, communicating with human beings is not logical. You may have noticed, yeah? Communicating with human beings is not logical, it's biological. And when you understand the biology, you can make it logical again, but anyone who goes in thinking that logic by itself should win is just never gonna be as effective as if they understand that there's something else. So let me tell you one of the core key pieces of biology around communicating with human beings. If you look at a cross section of a human brain, you'll see the brain stem and then wrapped around that is the midbrain. And together they form what's called the paleomammalian brain or the limbic system or the emotional brain. Three different names for the same thing. And then wrapped around the outside of that is the neocortex or the cerebral cortex the new brain, right? Neo means new. So the new brain wrapped around the outside of the old brain. And that's really significant. And I'll tell you why. Because the ancient brain does not have access to language or logic or reason. But it does have access to reality on a much deeper level than we will ever have access consciously. Now, let me say that again, because that's kind of weird. The ancient paleomammalian brain does not have access to language or logic or reason. That's all in the neocortex, the new brain. But it does have access to reality on a fundamentally deeper level than we will ever have access consciously. And what I mean by that is that's the part of the brain that smells pheromones and that sees facial micro expressions and that notices all that completely unconsciously sent and received body language and it hears vocal stress and it sees patterns in things that we'll never notice consciously. So that ancient part of the brain is really dialed into reality, but it can't talk to us. So how does it communicate with us? Here's how it communicates with us. Gut feelings. That's where gut feelings come from is from your paleomammalian ancient brain. So you know, if your mom didn't tell you, I'm telling you now, trust your gut. That's good information. That's that 
part of your brain that really has access to reality sees and notices things we don't notice consciously and it lets you know through gut feelings and so you know long story short if the elevator door opens and the hair stands up on the back of your neck and you think i shouldn't get in there don't get in there don't get in there because if it's a nice person they'd want you to trust your gut and if it's not a nice person we don't want you in there with them right so trust your gut but we all think that we're logical, right? Oh, John, well, you know, I'm going to, I weigh things out and I check the boxes and I, you know, I, I make logical decisions. Well, you may do all that stuff and you may check the boxes and, you know, go through the steps. But if we put any of you in an fMRI machine and watched your brain in real time, as you made a choice or a decision, what we would see is that Boom, your ancient paleo mammalian brain fires first, making the decision. And then right after that, your neocortex fires, agreeing with or disagreeing with the decision, but not making the decision. So what does that look like in real life? Here's what it looks like. Think if you've ever been in a situation like this. Do you like the product? Yeah, we like the product. Yeah. Do you think it's priced right? Oh, yeah, it's a good price. Uh -huh. Do you think it would make a difference for you to have it? Oh, certainly, yes. Well, do you want to sign the check and we'll start delivery? No, no, we're not ready yet. Like we we want to think about it a little longer. Yeah. Now I hear people laugh. That's a laughter of recognition, right? You recognize that. And that's pretty frustrating, right? When you're trying to raise millions of dollars for your company or you're trying to get people on board with an initiative that you've got or whatever it is when you get yes 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 no it makes it seem like they were lying or they were you know something something was wrong there right yes 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 no well here's what happened it's really obvious in hindsight they weren't lying what happened is yes 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 no logic 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 emotion we didn't make an emotional connection with them that would allow them to give us what I call the fourth and most important yes. Yes, 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 yes. That's because of an emotional connection. That's because we allowed them, we, you know, we had them feel like they were in the same tribe with us. We we noticed how we were connected. We, you know, that emotional connection is what gets us that fourth and most important yes. So now this is really important. Do you have any questions about it? Does it make sense? Does it not make sense? Do you recognize? What do you think? Do you want to have any questions? How about just giving me a big nod if this makes sense? <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, question. Uh, we got a question. Uh, is this why it's so hard to break habits? It's a really good question. Um, let me think about that for a second. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because right, logically, we know we should break the habit, right? But that deeper programming is, you know, that's deeper. The interesting thing is that the the logical brain is wrapped around the outside of the emotional brain, right? It has to go through the emotional brain to get to the spinal column to actually make something happen. And so I couldn't address, I can't answer that question with certainty, but I suspect it's related, you know, and it certainly points to the fact that logic is not, you know, I say logic is necessary, but it's not sufficient, right? You, it also takes that emotional connection. Hey, John, what is the difference between trusting your gut and having impulsive decisions? You know, that comes down to just paying attention and learning. You got to learn to distinguish your gut from an impulse decision. And, you know, your gut is, is going to be telling you things about stuff that's in your reality. Like, you know, if you wake up and you think, oh, you know, like something's going to happen like far away whatever, I shouldn't do that. Unless there's some way that your gut could have known that, seen something, smelled something, heard something, noticed a pattern in something, then that may not be your gut, right? 
Um, and I think it's something to start now and practice for the rest of your life, distinguishing when it's that really that gut feeling, you know, and you know it, you can feel it. Right. And, uh, and it's coming to you because of something that you have perceived in reality. Good. Any more questions? All right. But does this make sense? So the big point is until you have an emotional connection, all the logic in the world just bounces off. It really doesn't matter because it's bouncing off that emotional brain and the logical brain can't get through the emotional brain unless we've made an emotional connection. So that's why, uh, you know, it's so important to know your audience, speak to them, uh, tell stories, share why things matter to you. You know, I think often in business, we try to be all cut and dried and, and very logical because that, but that removes the chances of an emotional connection. No syndrome, right? When you're out to raise money, the venture capital folks will tell you they don't want to hear the inspirational stuff and they don't want the emotional stuff. They just want the, you know, business plan and the facts and stuff. They're lying. Don't ever believe that because, you know, they've got the money. They want to do something that inspires them. And, you know, the reason that we all shy away from making an emotional connection or trying to be inspiring or things like that is because we see people do it as a manipulation and we see people do it inauthentically and that sucks, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about influence and influence comes from authenticity and influence is out to serve the good of everybody that's involved. Where it goes wrong is manipulation, which is selfish and inauthentic. Okay. That's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about authenticity and actually making an emotional connection and influencing for the good of everyone that's involved. Make sense? So these are definitely tools that can be used for the dark side, but uh, don't do that. Um, it doesn't feel good and it doesn't, it doesn't work as well anyway. So um, the, so that's the neurobiology and fundamentally it's really important to make a connection. And a lot of the work I do is helping people tell their stories and create their pitches to do that. So, you know, that's, there's, there's more than we have time for tonight, but let me just say that one thing that can help you in this realm is to get that small talk has been misnamed. Small talk is not small talk. Small talk is big talk, but we don't take advantage of it because we don't understand it. Here's the thing. When you talk about, when you, you know, meet somebody and there's a little small talk at the bus stop or whatever, we call it small talk because it doesn't seem to matter what we talk about. And in a way it doesn't matter. We could talk about anything, but the way you turn small talk into big talk is by talking about something that does matter and that connects you somehow. So, you know, whatever you can do to turn those moments of small talk into moments that can connect you, find things that you have in common, find tribes that you belong to together. Like we both have dogs, you know, or we, we, uh, we both care about this cause or that cause. When you do that and you use that small talk to find ways to connect with the person you're talking to, small talk turns into big talk. Good. Okay. Um, so uh, the next big thing that I would like to share with you is something that it took me a long time to get. And it makes an enormous difference when you're pitching, when you're speaking in both your personal life, your professional life, large groups, small groups. And here's how I say it. Your, your presentation is not a presentation. It's a performance. And here's what I mean. 
what I don't mean <laughs> first is when I say performance, people are like, you know, oh, you don't, you mean you're not really being yourself? No, I don't mean that kind of performance. It's kind of in the word presentation. When I present something to you, well, okay, my job's done, right? I presented it to you. There it is. You've got it. I presented it. We're done. But in a performance, think about when you went to the theater the last time there was music playing. They chose that music on purpose. There might've been a scent in the air. There's those red velvet curtains. There's the paintings and the carvings and the whole thing is quite an event. And they have already started to take responsibility for your experience before the play even starts, right? So what I mean by a performance is that you take responsibility for their experience. And, you know, I used to talk to the press a lot and I would get misquoted. It's just something that happens. And uh, I got pretty frustrated about it. And I was in a course, a uh, growth, personal growth and development course, looking at this question a long time ago. And I realized something big for myself. I realized that I had been being responsible for what I said. And I thought that was pretty good. You know, I'm responsible for what I say, you know, that's pretty good. But what I realized in this course is that that was actually stopping early. I realized I could not only be responsible for what I said, I could be responsible for what they heard. And now that sounds kind of crazy. How could I be responsible for what another human being hears? Well, I don't know, but I took it on because it inspired me and I thought it was a pretty great idea. And I started to really just try to be responsible for what other people were hearing from me. And as I look back on what I did, I realized three big things and they apply anywhere, not just talking to the press. The first one is when I got a chance to talk to them, instead of thinking, oh, you know, I'm busy, I would actually go read one or two of their articles before I spoke to them, instead of reading none of their articles like I did before. And when I read one or two of their articles, I would know them versus knowing nothing about them, and it would alter how I spoke. So the first thing is know your audience. Really take a minute to get to know your audience. The second thing was that when I said something really important, I would ask them to play it back to me so I could be sure I had communicated it correctly. Now, I did something similar before that because they teach you that in media training. I would say, would you mind playing that back to me so I can be sure you got it? Oh, that is not good. That's a judgment on them. Nobody likes that, right? But when I say, would you play that back to me so I can be sure I communicated it correctly? Well, now that's different, right? Now they're helping me out. It's not a judgment on them. And people were happy to do that. And then the third thing I did, and probably the biggest thing I did, is whenever they would talk, when they would play that back to me or whenever they would talk, I would listen like my life depended on it. I just started listening in a whole new way whenever they spoke. And those three things made it so that I never, almost never got misquoted again, a couple times. And it was embarrassingly for the better instead of embarrassingly for the worse, like it had been in the past. And it also really changed my life and my results. And I realized that I had been really interested before in checking the box. I told you so, right? That's pretty fun, right? Oh, I told you so. Oh, you should have listened to me. Oh, I told you so. Yeah, but that means we didn't get the results we wanted. And as entrepreneurs, bottom line is results. You know, you're not working at the DMV. You're, work, you're an entrepreneur. So to check the box, I told you so, that doesn't help. I started getting interested in checking the box. I landed it over there. And as I focused on checking that box, things really changed and it made a huge difference. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, tell you a quick story about how I used this when I was uh, speaking. Would you like to hear that? Okay. So I was speaking to this group in Finland, this, this group of 12 to 16 year old girls who were all you know, they were going to be the future leaders of, of Estonia, excuse me, it was Estonia. And, um, and they, they, uh, 
wanted me to come speak. And I thought, okay, well, I'd love to go speak to them, but how can I be responsible for what they hear? How can I make sure that what I say lands? And uh, so I thought about it. And when I went that day, I started in a different way than I normally would. Now, normally I would tell you never say, hi, I'm John Bates. It's an honor to be here. What a pleasure, you know, like, nah, don't do that. If you feel like you need to say that stuff, say it after you say something interesting and and important. Don't Don't start like that. It's a terrible way to start. But I did it on purpose this time. I walked out, they introduced me, John Bates, and I said, hi, you know, gosh, it's really an honor to be here with you. I know who you are. You're going to be running the country in a few years, and I'm really excited to be with you. But, you know, I don't know exactly why you invited me because, you know, I'm kind of an older white dude and you're a bunch of young Estonian women, and I just don't know what I have for you, you know? And they all looked at me like, like I was crazy. And they, they, like there was this silence for a moment. And then one of the young girls kind of near the front sat up and put her fists on her hip. And, well, Mr. Bates, you train the astronauts and you train people at Johnson and Johnson and Boston Scientific and all over the world. And we want to know what you teach them. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. Does that sound okay with the rest of you? And I looked around and everybody nodded like I was kind of dumb or something. And I said, oh, okay, great. Well, let's do that. And I jumped in and did my, you know, did my thing. But what I noticed is because I made them pull it out of me, they were vastly more attentive and engaged. And I think that it landed over there in a way that it wouldn't have if I hadn't started like that. Does that make sense? So to think about what can I do to make sure that this lands over there, that they, that, that I land this versus just presenting it. Yeah. All right, good. So you could be responsible for what they hear. And that is a great place to live because that'll give you much better results. Yep. All right. So um, any other questions, any thoughts about this? Is this making sense? Yeah. How do you actualize that in day-to-day -day life? Like you're talking about public speaking, but this sounds like it would be a skill that would be useful all the time. Oh, everything I'm telling you, everything I'm telling you today is an everything skill. It's useful for public speaking. Absolutely. As you said, don't leave this to public speaking, take everything I'm sharing with you to your whole entire life, you know? And it could be something as simple as just looking a little more closely at their face as you're telling them what you're telling them and really reading their reaction. And it could be something as thought out as, maybe I need to restructure this, maybe I need to, um, you know, have them remind me of why they would care. You know, it can, you can go a lot of places with this, but when you take responsibility for what they hear in your personal life, it's amazing. You know, like uh, there have been more than, there's been more than once when my wife screwed something up, right? <laughs> and I was like, oh, you know what? That's on me. I didn't communicate well enough to get what I wanted out of that. And if I had been more clear, you wouldn't have done that incorrectly, right? So I, what I used to do would be to blame her, but no, I don't, if I don't get what I want out of my communication, well, that's on me. Yeah. So definitely all of this stuff I would take to your whole entire life. So uh, how about the, uh, three ways to connect with and inspire any audience anywhere, anytime. Would that be useful if you knew you could do that as a speaker? Okay. All right. So here we go. The three ways to connect with and inspire any audience anywhere, anytime. Number one is from a guy named Les Brown. And he's one of the world's most highly requested, highly paid, popular public speakers of all time. And he 
uh, told me years ago, people don't connect with your successes. They connect with your messes. Your message is in your mess. Now, that's kind of hard because a lot of times we're out there in the business world trying to look good and we want everybody to think we're successful and we're amazing. And, you know, we don't want to talk about our failures, but <clears throat> that's what connects people with us. And it's not just getting up and whining about something. It's sharing a failure or a mess and really importantly, what you learned from that. What did you learn from that mess? Okay, that's the nugget. And when you're willing to admit that you fell down somewhere, that humanizes you. And when you share the lesson, that's valuable to us because we don't want to make the same mistake. If we can learn from you and avoid it, that'd be great, right? So, uh, you know, in the dot-com days, I lost my dot-com company after raising over $80 million dollars. And I almost, you know, with my partners, and I almost died of an autoimmune disease. I was so upset about it. And there are two big things that I want to share with you out of that. One is, as I was sitting there thinking I was going to die, I looked back over my life and I realized that it had been pretty small and selfish and pretty much all about me, you know, me, me, me. I was nice enough, but I, but it was about me and, and that's just all it had been about. And I really didn't want that to be what I left the world with my life, you know? And so I, you know, I call it the big is, the universe, God, whatever you want to say. I said, if you let me walk out of here, if you let me live, I promise the number one thing that I will focus on is just making a difference. And I got to walk out. I'm still around. And I did focus on making a difference. Like I really made that one of the things that was just at the top of my list about what I cared about doing. And my life has been gravy since then. You know, that made a big difference in the fact that I focused on making a difference and had that be a big looming thing in my life made my life a lot better. And the second thing is, I, I came across a quote and I wish I had had it when I failed. I found it a while after, but the quote says, there will come a time when you think everything is finished. That is the beginning. Now, you, if those things mean anything to you, you can have them and you don't have to almost die to get them because I did, right? And you've got things that you could share out of your messes that would make a difference for us. And we would love that because that's really valuable information. So people don't connect with your successes. They connect with your messages. messes. Your message is in the mess. your mess. That's right. And it actually doesn't make you look <laughs> bad to share a, uh, mistake that you learned from it makes you look self-reflective and like you learn from your mistakes and that's the kind of person people want to invest in people want to work with people want to be around yeah okay you ready for number two okay sometimes you do have to talk about your successes and because if you don't talk about your successes no one's going to know about them and it's important for people to sometimes know about your successes because if you don't tell them about those successes, then they don't know the full you. So how do you tell them about your successes without turning them off or alienating them? Comes from a guy named Craig, Craig Valentine who told me years ago, don't make yourself special, make the process special. Don't make yourself special, make the process special. Now in high school, I won basically every contest I ever entered in public speaking and debate, first, second, or third place, except for one. And that judge apologized to me two years later and told me I should have won. He was glad he tracked me down and, and apologized. So I had a pretty successful high school public speaking debate career. And I used to think that's because I was good. That's wrong. I was. It's not because I was good. Here's why. I realize as I look back on that, that I had a world-class public speaking 
coach and debate coach at my public high school in Salt Lake City, Utah, just purely out of luck. And because he was so crazy and wild, I thought he was super cool and did anything he wanted. So I had a world-class coach and I was coachable. That's how I did that. That's why that worked. It wasn't to do with me. It was because I had a world-class coach and I was coachable. Look at someone like Tiger Woods, right? He beat everybody for what seemed like forever. He had multiple coaches. None of his coaches could beat him at golf or they would have. But together, because he was coachable, they had him beat everybody for a really long time. When you want to be good at something, find a great coach and be coachable. Now, that's number two, and that's how you can talk about your successes. What it requires of you is to just go identify what the process was that had you succeed. But when you identify the process, it becomes even more valuable because now you know why it worked, right? I get that I had a great coach and I was coachable, want to have great coaches and be coachable a lot more once I realized that. Yeah. So don't make yourself special, make the Process. process special perfect okay now uh let's talk about the third thing the third way um it's from a woman named nancy duarte and she says don't be the hero of your own talk make the audience the hero and as an entrepreneur don't be the hero of your own team make the team the hero don't be Luke Skywalker, be Yoda. Okay, so let me do a quick little demonstration, even though we're virtual here. Um, let's say that I'm going to be Luke first, okay? Let's see what that would be like. Um, so here's Luke. My lightsaber. <laughs> Fancy tricks, all that stuff. Thank you very much. Okay, so there we go. A little lightsabers showing off and demonstration and that was pretty cool but now let's try how would it be different if i were yoda or obi-wan okay here's how it'd be different this is an elegant weapon from a more civilized time and if you practice and use the force you could change the destiny of the galaxy here try it right? I'm handing it to you. You take it now. Go be great, right? So that's the difference. Don't be the hero of your own talk. Make the audience the hero. Don't be Luke, be Yoda. So now imagine that you gave a talk where you talked about one, a big mistake and a, and a really important lesson. Then you shared a couple of successes and the processes, and then you bundled that all up and you handed it to your audience and told them to use it and go be great. And here you go. That talk will do really well. Even if you mess up a few words or things, it doesn't matter. That will be an inspiring talk. Good. Now, these things can work in conversations too. You know, if you bring any of this stuff to just a conversation with a friend, it's going to work as well. So, what questions do you have? Those are the three ways to connect with and inspire any audience anywhere, anytime. There's the uh, be responsible for what they hear. And then there's the neurobiology and the importance of that emotional connection. Do you have any questions about that stuff? Yes. Can you give us the rundown of how you use those three tips in this talk? <laughs> really good question. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I use those three tips in those three tips, right? So I gave you a story for each of the points that I made. Here's another great saying. Never tell a story without a point and never make a point without a story. So I try really hard to tell a story for each point that I make. And, you know, uh, so, you know, I do try really hard to walk my talk. And hopefully you've noticed that I'm, I'm doing the things that I'm talking about. 
And uh, I guess that the the final thing would be for me to to say to you what I'm going to say, which is these are some of the most important things that I teach people. And they're some of the most powerful tools that I know of to influence and communicate with people and to, you know, be effective in your communication and get people to, you know, step up and yeah. sign up and take action and all of that. And uh, I think that entrepreneurs are going to save the planet. You know, I, I think that entrepreneurs are who make the economy run. I think entrepreneurs are who, who are going to actually quite, quite actually save the planet. And, you know, you are the future of all of that. And so the more effective that I can help you be at communicating those excellent ideas that you have out into the world, the bigger the difference you can make and the better the world that I live in gets. Go ahead. Yes, question, uh huh? So, hey, real, real quick, John, real, real quick, John, that was you handing the lightsaber back to that gentleman at the same time. That was the third part right there. So that was great. Yeah, good. All right, and that the question in the second row there? Yeah, so um, in business, we talk about having the elevator pitch and the elevator talk. So if you were to have two minutes and you have to introduce yourself to someone um, and you have to grab their attention, what are the things that um, we should begin with to grab their attention and what are some important things that we should include in that two minutes? You know, it's a really good question. And it kind of depends. I'm, I think about that a lot in terms of pitching because I do a lot of pitch coaching for, for startups. And so, um, you know, I've got, a, so I've got a few things and I don't know how to get them to you the best way. Uh, I'll put some links in the chat and then maybe I guess I could send them to you, Jean. Um, yeah. But one is... Uh, two documents about creating what I call your superhero origin story. Now, this, I think, for where you are in the stage you are in life and business and everything, this is crucially important for you to create an origin story that says who you are and why you care about what you care about <clears throat> so that you can share who you are. I apologize, that keeps going off. Um, so you can share who you are with the people that you want to meet and work with and, and, you know, have mentor you and things like that. So that there's, there's a Dropbox link, two very short PDF documents. Look at those documents, work on your story. And, you know, my, my elevator pitch right now is basically the story that I opened with. Do you remember? I'm the guy, I was always the guy with the soft skills, worked with the people with the hard skills. Then I had this aha moment, right? And I created this training. It's all based in the science of communication. And that's what I do now. That story works really well for me because it says pretty succinctly who I am and what I do and what's different about what I do. And, you know, that's a great, pitch for me. And when you have a pitch like that for you, it makes, it just makes all the difference in the world. Like that's the, the final point I want to make really is you being able to tell your story in a way that connects to people to you and lets them know who you are and why you care about what you care about is just one of the most important things. And people always think, well, oh, I don't want to talk about myself. Yeah, but when we're meeting people and we're interviewing and we're doing those things, you got to talk about yourself. So much better to think about it and prepare what you're going to say and craft what you're going to say with that audience you're speaking to in mind so that you can share that story in a way that's really powerful and emotionally connected. And then the other thing that happens when you share that story 
in a short, succinct, good way is that people open up and they start to want it, they start to want to tell you their story. And that's when it's really important to listen, right? And that's when that connection starts to become two-way and deepen. So it's sort of a sideways answer to your question, but that those documents about your origin story, I think are invaluable. And at first your origin story is going to be too long. That's fine. Five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever. Then boil it down to that two minute version that says only the important stuff for the audience that you're speaking to. Think about them as you craft and hone that story because ultimately they're the ones that it needs to land for, right? Now, let me tell you an, another quick thing. I do a mini training, you know, basically an email every Sunday. And uh, I'll give you a link to sign up for that for free. It's the thing I do for all my clients and you can get it for free if you'd like. And uh, at first you're going to get about six or seven emails and I'm going to ask you questions and, you know, say what's most important to you and Hey, I've got this right now. Are you interested? That stuff will stop after about six or seven emails. And then you'll just get every Sunday, a really good two minute video to just keep your head in the game of leadership and communications. So I would, I would really request that you sign up for that. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things that if you just keep it on your mind and in your mind all the time, a little bit, you're going to be way ahead in a few years from now than if you just, you know, sat here and thought about it and then forgot about it. Does that make sense? So the goal of that is to help you create a good uh, leadership communications habit. And hey, John, then, yeah. One more thing as well. Like, can you can you give any advice to uh, the, the students um, about like being early in your career and trying to move forward, but dealing with imposter syndrome and trying to you know get past that so that your professional career can be enhanced? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I realized several years ago, listening to this guy who was probably in his 70s or 80s getting yet another award. He had written 50 books and been honored by every major university everywhere and is getting another award. I could hear in his speaking that he had imposter syndrome still. He really didn't. He was, you know, and I was like, oh my God, if this guy has imposter syndrome, then everybody has imposter syndrome, you know? And, uh, you know, I hope it's okay for me to say this here. Um, and I hope I say this in a sensitive way, but I was just doing a training a few months ago and this really vivacious, powerful young black woman walked up to me after the training and she, and kind of got me away from everybody else. And she looked at me and she said, I thought until today, I thought imposter syndrome was only for black women. And I looked at her for a second and she looked at me for a second because it was a very serious moment. And then like it crossed her mind and she broke out in this big grin and we just both laughed, mm -hmm. you know, because every, that's the thing about imposter syndrome. He thinks they're the only one, right? It's only for black women. It's only for Hispanic guys from a certain neighborhood. It's only, you know, everybody suffers from imposter syndrome. So let's just, you know, when we're working with fractions, if everything is over two, we could just divide by that two and get rid of the denominator and it gets a lot easier, right? So everyone has imposter syndrome, whether they admit it or not. And it doesn't help you at all. So just let it go. You want to know I, I, it just, that's just the fact. Everybody has it and you can just divide by that and get rid of it. Is that helpful at all? Like I give you my word, everybody has it. Any other questions before we let John go? 
Hey, John, I've got a question for you. Oh, yeah. Wait, for, front row. But so, so quick question. I love the concept of whether investors invest in the jockey or the horse. And this is a classic thing that I think early stage entrepreneurship um, has to face, right? You have this idea and there's so much importance in the idea and pitching this idea. So the idea gets across. But I want you to tell us a little bit. Do you think the investor invests in the jockey or the horse, the jockey being the entrepreneur? And I think this is an interesting debate to where so much focus is on what the idea is. But as you're talking today, so much about the story and so much about the founder, especially early stage when it might take you one, two, three, four tries at different businesses before you get traction. And so there's such a disappointment or letdown if your business doesn't work. But I want people to understand that people are investing in founders who have the ability to ride multiple horses. And, I, and I'd love your perspective since you've been through so many situations and worked with so many successful entrepreneurs. So I completely agree. And they say, you know, we're in, you know, we're investing in you. And that's what they mean. And, um, you know, when people tell me, oh, I've got this great idea, but if I told you I'd have to kill you, I just laugh, <laughs> right? Because it's not about the idea, it's about the execution. And that comes down to you and your team and your ability to actually do that idea. And, you know, at Johnson & Johnson, I worked with a team and they had licensed this technology. They built this whole company around it. They'd raised money. They'd gotten into J Labs. They were all ready to go. And when they all quit their jobs and came to work and called to finalize the, uh, the licensing of the technology that they were going to build their whole company on, the, they, they, the license was not available anymore. And they were like, oh, what are we going to do? Right. Cause we've accepted all this money. We've just quit our jobs. Holy smoke. So what they did is they went and locked themselves in a garage and figured out a better way to do it. than the license they were going to get and then did their whole company based on that. And that's what they mean when they say we're investing in you, not the, not, not the company. Right. Uh, they want to know that you're the kind of person who's going to stick to it and keep going. And they, they want to know you and your character, which is why your story and who you are is so important. Awesome. Thank you. All right. To the front row. Aside from what you've said so far today, if you could go back in time and tell yourself one thing to make yourself a more effective communicator, what would it be? Okay, good question. Let me think about that for a second. To be a more effective communicator. Well, you know, I mean, the, the thing that just comes to mind, so I'll go with it is, uh, and I've taken a lot of ground in this, but there's always ground to take. <laughs> Listening. Listening is the key in communicating, you know? Um, it really, really, really is. Cause you know, like, look, if I made a difference here tonight, it's yes, what I said matters, but I've said this when no one's listening and it doesn't make a difference. The real power in what we just did for this past hour is in your listening the generosity and the depth of your listening. So as a speaker to realize, I wish I would have realized a lot earlier that it's not about me. It's not about what I'm saying. It really is about the listening and to honor that listening and to be really aware of that listening and to really, um, you know, take that into account. That's a big deal. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Anything else? Any, any other questions at all? <clears throat> all right, John, thank you for your insights and your, your presentation today. We really appreciate it. Is there anything that they can do to show their appreciation? Can they follow you on social media? Can they, uh, they'll get access to the documents like you mentioned, but is there anything else they can do to show their appreciation? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn at just, you know, forward slash in forward slash John Bates. I'm easy to find there. 
if you'd follow me there, connect with me there, you know, share my stuff out, that'd be enormous. I would really appreciate that. Uh, I would love it if you'd sign up for my mini trainings, like that way we can keep in touch. And I promise that they're, they will be valuable to you. Um, I'm going to send you the link to those two documents. Those are for you. If you want them, go get them, use them, craft your origin story and start telling it and work with each other, support each other in that. It'll be one of the most important things that you do. If you do it, it won't be important if you don't do it, but if you do it, it'll be really important. And then, um, you know, I'll also send you a link to my itty bitty book, which is, I think, you know, it's, for sale at Amazon in Kindle for like $2.99. And if you want a really good guide for preparing for talks, it's about 45 pages long. So it's super short and uh, it's a good guide to preparing. So any and all of that, I would appreciate. And I would also hope that it would be really valuable to you too. All righty. All right, John, we will see you on the other side. Okay. All right. Thank you. I really appreciate being able to be with you. I've missed the entrepreneur center and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll see you on LinkedIn or wherever. And please, if any of this stuff works for you, uh, I would love to hear about it. And, you know, if, if you've got any questions or something short question or whatever, I'm just John at John Bates.com. So I'm easy to find. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Johnny. Great to see you, buddy. Likewise, Ryan. Likewise, and thank you, too. All right. Adios, everybody. Zot, zot, zot. See you. Zot, zot, zot. zot. <laughs>